Hey guys, my name is Mavi and I've spent the last 14 years in the plastic surgery and beauty industry, working alongside top board certified plastic surgeons. In that time, I've helped thousands of women in their surgical journey. My passion to educate and help women feel empowered is what led to what we now know as the Big Butts No Lies podcast. Join in on the fun as I talk to plastic surgery experts, friends, and real life patients about all things plastic surgery. Should be fun. Hey guys, do I have the episode for you today? The doctor I have on today was recommended in my DMs at least a thousand times. Patient after patient has requested, please interview Dr. Andre Marshall. And I'm so excited to have the double board certified plastic surgeon from Beverly Hills, California, who specializes in body contouring, liposuction, BBLs, tummy tucks, mommy makeovers. He has extensive training in surgery and plastic surgery at Vanderbilt and Duke, followed by an aesthetic surgery fellowship in Southern California. Dr. Marshall, thank you so much for being on the show today. I feel honored. Thank you for having me. We are going to talk about some of the juiciest stuff today. BBLs. And (laughs) you are with that magic wand delivering them all the time. So I thought who would be a better doctor to then talk about what we're going to talk about today? Because we're going to have real talk, you guys. We're going to give it to you the truth, what we see every day and take it like girl talk. It's girl talk. But this time we have Dr. Andre Marshall with us. <laughs> okay. So let me tell you guys about what we're going to talk about today. How important is post-operative care after surgery? This question, I probably answer it every day because there is just such a wide range of information on the internet and what patients are being told by their doctors. And I feel like there's a lot of change happening from one doctor to another doctor and what everybody's seeing online. And I want us to talk about really from a doctor's perspective, how important is post-operative care after surgery? Dr. Andre Marshall, can you tell us? If nothing else, I tell people that, you know, I do surgery four to five days a week. For me, it is not that difficult. Every patient is a little bit different, but honestly, when you get in a rhythm and you do, you know, thousands of these cases, you know, it's fairly easy, I would say, for the most part. But what you cannot predict is how well each patient will feel. I recently did a EBL on my nurse, my OR nurse, five months ago, and I did the same thing that I do for every case. I do lipo put the fat back in. I literally did nothing different. However, her post-op care has been so meticulous, even without a lot of my guidance. She just did things on her own. And she retained more fat than I've ever seen a patient retain. And every patient that comes in says, I want to look like her. Well, I want everyone to look like her, but I literally did nothing different on her, I promise. But she just had amazing post-op care. She kept up with her massages meticulously. She took care of her skin just the way she was supposed to. She even did hyperbaric oxygen, which I didn't require. She just kind of initiated that on her own. And to this day, she still continues to get maintenance massages. And I have patients who come in all the time and, you know, oh, I've done everything right. I've done this. I've done that. And yet you look at them and say, based upon where you started, this is probably where you should be. And we're not there. And it's typically an issue with the post-operative care. But I can tell you, if nothing else, it all starts with having a supportive caregiver at home. You can't do this alone. And anybody who thinks that they can just do this alone and, oh, my friend's going to drop by and stop in on me. It's so difficult to not have, you know, a good support system, whether that's a supportive boyfriend, husband, caretaker. You can't do this alone. That first week can be hell, depending on how many areas of life will you get, how extensive your procedure is. So having a good support system and proper post-operative care is the key to everything my opinion. I would have to agree with you. So post-op care, like I've told you ladies before, is so important that it can, I mean, it can make your recovery easier. It can give you better results. And the part that I'm struggling, Dr. Marshall, is just a general recommendation of post-op care because there's, you know, some surgeons don't even let their patients have massages until Uh six weeks. 
And, uh-huh. you know, part of what I preach on this show, of course, is you if you're signing up for your surgeon, it's because you've already done all your research. You understand what their post-op treatment is. You understand and you align with what they do. Mm-hmm. It's still just all over the place. And I kind of what is your recommendation for post-op care? Yeah. yeah. So let's say I, I do a BBL on you today. My recommendation is that on post-operative day number two, you start lymphatic drainage massages. I leave the um, incisions open, primarily in the front, so the fluid can drain on its own. Most of the time, if you're laying down, you're laying on your stomach or you're standing. So most of that fluid is going to run around from the back to the front, and that's where I leave my incisions open. I prefer manual lymphatic drainage, no machines. I don't let any machines touch your body for at least three months post-op, so no cavitation, radio frequency, or ultrasonic uh, lymphatic drainage, all manual. I prefer you to do that for at least three times a week for a minimum of 10 massages. I have patients who get upwards of 20 or 30 massages, and that's fine as well. But I do find that that first week, it's so important to make sure all of that excess fluid in your body is removed. I love it. Here is my question, Dr. Marshall. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you learn after when you're out on in your own in your own practice or is that what's taught in your residency is this i mean why is it not uniform across the board yeah so first off nothing that we do now if you ask most surgeons they'll tell you they learn most of this you know body contouring in regards to high volume liposuction and bbls on their own this is not taught in any residency program whether it's you know harvard ut southwestern duke vanderbilt UCLA, their focus is not teaching you how to become a BBL surgeon, doing cancer reconstruction, doing head and neck reconstruction, taking care of kids with cleft lip and palate. Yes, but you will not learn this at a university setting. If you do an aesthetic fellowship, which is advanced training after your residency or fellowship in plastic surgery, you may learn most of this. But to be honest with you, America tends to be a few steps behind when it comes to other countries and primarily 90% of what we do in body contouring originated in South America. And so the liposuction principles and, you know, fat transfer, a lot of what we do, we learn from those guys. And when you look at their protocols, they start massages even as early as post-operative day one, and they'll do 10 straight days of massage. So, you know, I think if you're willing to embrace, you know, the founders of what we do today, the South Americans, Brazilians, Colombians, etc. I think you're going to have a better grasp of the knowledge and have better results. 100%. So can you tell our girls, why does getting that fluid out help give them better results? If you imagine there's, there's layers to your skin, you have the skin on the outside that you can see. Beneath that, there are two different layers of fat, superficial and deep. And below that is your muscle. If you're getting liposuction, you're removing fat in two layers under the skin. Most of, most of the fat that's removed is a deep layer. Superficially, we tend to leave more fat behind just to give you a nice smooth contour, less fibrosis, less lumpy, bumpy, et cetera. Now you have a free-floating space where that fat used to be and fluid can build up. Our goal with wearing compression garments and foam is to allow that thin layer to adhere down to the muscle. That allows for faster healing, better contours, you look better, you feel better, et cetera. If that space is filled with fluid, then you're never going to have that skin tacked down or stick down to the muscle, and you're going to end up with the appearance of increased loose skin. You may end up with a seroma, which is a collection of fluid that can't get out. And that fluid usually has a little bit of blood in it. If you've had surgery, you notice that some of the drainage tends to be blood colored. Bacteria love the iron that's in blood. So if that fluid just sits inside of you, there's a good chance that any bacteria gets inside and multiplies, you could end up with an infection and that could put you in the hospital on IV antibiotics or needing repeat procedures. So multiple reasons why we want that fluid out of you. We don't want you active and running in the streets too soon. (laughs) We're ready, you know, kind of relaxing at home, Mm -hmm. moving around, but not running around at Target, you know, three days post-op doing all the grocery shopping. So it's very important to get those massages and get all that fluid out. How long do you have your girls wear compression? This is a a good question, I think. Three months minimum. That's just my rule. Three months minimum. 
23 hours a day, seven days a week. You can take it off for one hour a day. That's usually to shower, get a massage, or to go number two. But minimum three months is what I recommend. Most of my patients that have fantastic results, they'll go even longer. If they don't want to wear a Faha, I usually recommend some sort of shapewear, which can be found all over Amazon or you can find higher end shapewear, just a one piece without all the zips and hooks and everything else. But three months minimum for compression post-op. I got to say, you just said Faha so nicely. (laughs) (laughs) I think that word gets botched every day, but I love how you just pronounced it like that with ease. (laughs) <laughs> I don't even use the word garment. People look at me funny. I just say, you know, Faha and uh, my patients, they just get it it's the right away. So they know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we want you that they're going to get massages. They're going to be in their garment. What kind of nutritional diet or do you put them on a nutritional diet? What, what about what they yeah. take? Yeah. So I'll tell you just, so this is, this to me is the key post-op. I'll tell you, there, there are different people and I look at them and I say, you know, there are people with a higher BMI you know, that tend to have a lower metabolism. They will, by nature, retain more fat post-op. Your smaller, petite, B, lower BMI girls, they tend to have a higher metabolism. They tend not to be able to eat as much post-op. They are at higher risk for losing more fat. So if you're more on the petite side, say BMI is under 25, I'm going to have you doing two protein shakes a day. In addition to eating higher fat foods, such as salmon, I prefer you to eat salmon over tilapia, right? I prefer you to have more avocados in your diet. I even encourage them to maybe gain one to two pounds from their baseline weight just to make sure that they're eating enough. They're keeping up with their metabolism. Mm -hmm. If people don't feel you're normally eating 1,500 calories a day, after surgery, your body is working extra hard to, number one, repair all the damage to the tissue. And you've gone through a major stress. So now your body needs actually a few hundred more calories just to maintain everything. And with the Faha on, with the pain that you're going through and that you're, you're, you're just so bundled up with all this foam and garment, your stomach gets really full really quickly, especially with the tummy tuck. So most of the time people cannot eat as much as they did before surgery. So, you know, liquid protein drinks, liquid calories are extremely helpful post-op. So I do have a guide that I give my patients. I try to avoid a lot of high sodium foods for at least the first three to four weeks, avoid alcohol for a minimum of two weeks post-op, high protein, carbs are okay, just not in excess and higher fat foods, highly recommended. Beautiful. This is the answer to all those questions y'all, y'all keep sending me in my DM. This is what you wanted to hear. And I'm so glad Dr. Andre Marshall is telling us exactly what we needed to hear. Okay. So now let's say our patients are coming in to see you for a consultation. Mm -hmm. Do you think wish picks are useful when they come in? You know what? I think wish picks are more useful for you telling me what you don't want. The biggest problem I see with with wish picks are the person looks nothing like you. You don't bring in their baseline. And the majority are these Instagram influencers with two to three million followers who we're blessed with a genetically great body and have the best Photoshop artists in the world. So I say, first off, if you're going to show me a picture, your best bet is to find a patient from my page, whether that's my you know website or my Instagram, find somebody that looks like you. If you are 45 with four kids and don't bring me a 22-year-old who's never been pregnant and is a completely different height, weight, and build from you. So that's very important. If you just bring me pictures of an influencer with no before pictures or no context, that's also a no-no in my opinion. So I think it's fine to have wish pics, but if they're not realistic and if you can't find their before and compare it to your before, including your frame, the amount of skin you have, the height, weight, et cetera, I don't think it's, it's as useful as people think it is. I tell my girls to bring in a picture to me, like when they when I talk to them, because it helps me gauge how realistic your expectations are. <laughs> yeah. It really helps me like f- know, OK, you have no idea what we can do with plastic surgery or you do know what we can do with plastic surgery. Like <laughs> exactly like what you were talking about. If it's a mom of four and she's showing me a 22 year old, like I understand. OK, well, let's we have to adjust your expectations. So how do you do that for your patients? How do you help adjust their expectations when it comes to their surgery? A couple of things I do is, 
you know, after you've done, you know, thousands of surgeries, you start to, you have a collection of patients. And oftentimes I can see a patient and I can say, you know what? I have somebody who looks exactly like you. They're very similar height, weight, build. Here's their surgery. Here's their before and after. Do you like this? Yes or no? Because this is the extent of what I can do with the body shape that you have. And if they're like, you know what? I really like that. And I say, okay, we're on the same page. But if you're like, oh, that's as big as you can make her butt with one round. Then I said, maybe I'm not the surgeon for you. Maybe you need to go across the border where they do muscle injection regularly. But if you don't like my own pictures of what I can do, then I might not be the surgeon for you. I can tell you as a surgeon, what you don't want is you don't want a patient bringing in another surgeon's photos. Like I've had so many patients bring me five, six photos from a popular surgeon out there. And I'm like, if you really like that look, you need to just go with that surgeon. Oh, well, that surgeon turned me down. Well, there's probably a good reason they turned you down because they, <laughs> they collectively pick people that they know will get a crazy, crazy good result. Fine. They turned you down because you're not that person. So don't bring me photos from that surgeon, you know. <laughs> that is so funny. That's so funny yeah. because uh-huh. like, it's so true. It's uh-huh. so right. true. So when you're gauging their expectations, seeing pictures of, you know, what their wish pick is, I think is a really good way. And you touched on something that I think is really important. And I haven't talked about it on the show, but this is the episode to talk about it. Let's talk about the under the muscle injection that injections or fat grafting that they do in other countries and some places here in the U.S., even though they're not supposed to, they still are doing it. And what we're really supposed to be doing safely. Can you tell Mm -hmm. us about that a little bit? Yeah. So I only inject fat above the muscle, never into the muscle. When all this initially started, we know that fat survives. When you take fat out of your body, it's essentially no longer alive. It's like a transplant. You take a heart out of one patient, that heart is no longer alive. It's on ice. You put the patient, hook it up to blood, and it survives. When we put fat in, we're placing it somewhat blindly into other fat or into the muscle. And we're waiting for new blood vessels through a process called angiogenesis to grow into that fat to keep it alive. During those however many weeks you believe it is, whether it's three, four, five, six weeks, 12 weeks, during that time, new blood vessels grow into the fat. Some fat dies. During that time, some fat stays until it has new blood growth. Fat will always survive better in the muscle. If you inject fat in the muscle anywhere, because muscle has better blood supply than fat. If you were to cut a muscle, it's going to bleed like crazy. If you were to cut through some fat, it might bleed, it may not. So placing fat into muscle means you will keep more of that fat because more of it will get a good blood supply. So for years, even American surgeons for years injected fat into the muscle, whether that was into the deltoids, into the rectus, abdominus muscles, into the gluteus muscle, because you got better results. There's no question. But we know it comes with a significantly higher risk. All it takes is a small tear of the gluteal vein. That fat gets sucked in. You will die on the table or in the recovery area as soon as that fat hits your lung. To me, it's not worth that risk. If people bring me wish picks of girls and I see crazy, crazy projection, I know. And they say, oh, this is my friend who went to, let's say, TJ, which is you know Tijuana or Dominican Republic. Odds are with crazy projection that you can see coming a mile down the street, that is muscle injection. And I tell people, I cannot do that because I do not inject muscle. I would love to do it if it was 100% as safe as over the muscle, but it's not. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. Nearly every big name muscle injecting doctor had at least one death. You can name them. Every single one of the Dominican Republic, they've all had at least one death. Some have had over 15 to 20 me, it's not worth that risk. I would rather you have more of a natural look and be alive to go home to your three kids than to go for the nicest, biggest butt out there and take a know. bigger risk. Exactly. Exactly. I, so yes, muscle injection, your butt will look bigger, rounder, you'll keep more fat, but it's not worth the risk of the complications and that's death. So I will not do it. And I don't advocate you go to somebody who does unless you're willing to meet your maker. Yeah. And I would not recommend if you know they're injecting under the muscle, you go the other way and that's it. I've had Mm -hmm. patients in front of me and I've had to have this conversation about why we don't inject under the muscle and all of it. And they're like, then I'm just going to go to where they do. And okay, that's, I wish you wouldn't, but 
when I feel like cost has a lot to do with, you know, making that decision for some women where they're like, I'm only going to be able to get one round. So I'm going to go where they do it, which is, is it legal? I know you won't do it, but can doctors still do that here in the U.S.? Yes, yes they can. And it's, it's still done. It's more probably done in, I know there's several doctors who in South Florida still do it. It's, it's yes, it's routinely done. Not near as routine as it was, you know, five years ago, prior to a lot of recommendations coming out. But yes, there are doctors in America, multiple states who still do muscle injection. There's doctors who tell you they don't do it, but yes, they do do it. So when you see people coming out with a crazy, crazy, crazy projection with one round, and they came from essentially nothing, like super flat, be very wary of how that happened. And I'm not saying that because the skin will only stretch so much. Mm-hmm. After you've done thousands of cases, you know what the skin's you know capacity to stretch is. So just be very careful of what you hear and what you see. Um, if it looks too good to be true, often it is. Agreed. And this is we're teaching you guys how to be better patients, smarter consumers with your plastic surgery. On this topic of you know rounds and BBLs. Let's talk about plastic surgery trends with the BBLs. I know there's been like, oh, the the big, big BBL is over. We're going into a more natural look, which I kind of agree. I kind of agree that we are going into a more like natural look. But something that you and I talked about just a few minutes ago before I started recording. Sorry, guys, I had to get a little a little convo in before I started recording and y'all missed it a little bit. But we're going to talk about it again. Butt reductions and can and does your butt still keep growing after surgery if you do not change your diet? That's a that's a fantastic question. Great question. So my general rule is whatever fat cells you have after three months, you're going to keep those cells forever. And I'll break it down to you this way. The number of fat cells you currently have, let's just say you have you never had surgery or liposuction, you were born with a pain of, of cells. It's probably in the billions but let's just say everybody's born with 1 billion fat cells in their body. Those fat cells, you don't grow new fat cells as you get older. Those fat cells either increase in size or, you know, or they shrink. Just like you're born with one humerus, one femur bone, it grew with you uh, as you got older. When you take fat out of a certain area, that fat is permanently gone. People say, but I gained 20 pounds and the fat came back to my stomach. Yes, because the remaining fat cells, because we never remove 100% of the fat, those remaining fat cells can enlarge. When you take do a BBL, do lipo 360 or whatever, put the fat in the buttocks. I say after three months, whatever cells you currently have after three months, those cells are now permanently attached to your buttocks. If you lose weight, your butt will go down. If you gain weight, it will go, it can go back up. But now you permanently have those cells there. If you gain 20 to 30 pounds, maybe five years down the line, yes, your butt will get larger. I've even seen it within the first year and vice versa. So if you are somebody who is prone to fluctuations in your weight, then you have to be very conscientious of how big you go initially because it will grow. And most of the reductions that I've seen are people who are five plus years down the line who had a BBL, looked great. They showed me their photos after surgery the first few years and they kind of let themselves go. And voila, now their butt is why is it as big as, you know, it was immediately post-op? And what's the solution other than losing weight? I mean, because <laughs> you would think the solution is to get back to a normal weight, but what's the, if they can't? I mean, if you can't, it's almost like, you know, as your women with large breasts, they have to get a breast reduction. Women with oversized buttocks have to get a buttock reduction. That's usually done through liposuction. The concern with that, though, is just like, liposuction anywhere on the body, if you lipo the buttocks, you cannot guarantee that that skin will retract and give you the nice shape that you previously had. So there's always that risk when you do liposuction anywhere on the body, there could be loose, saggy skin associated with it. I think it's really hard to gauge when you're lipoing the buttocks because you're laying down on the table and you're injecting the body with fluid. You know, what what is the end point? When is the patient going to be happy? Did I take Mm -hmm. off too much? Mm -hmm. Did I take off? not enough. It's really, really difficult to tell. Everyone looks different laying down than they do standing up. 
When you look at an abdomen picture on the table, surgeon did lipo. Yeah, it looks great, but they have gravity working against them, pulling the visceral fat in, pulling the abdomen skin down. When they stand up, everything looks different. So gauging how much of a butt reduction to do is really difficult because it's not something we routinely do every day. And if you ask most surgeons they, who do BBLs, they've probably done less than 20 butt reductions in their whole career, as opposed to the thousands of BBLs they've done. I do think in the future, we will see more of these reductions because girls have gone so big in the past several years with weight gain, poor lifestyle habits, access to fast food, going to make it difficult for us in the future. I 100% agree. And I have talked about it on this show at least on five episodes about ladies, please, if you are on the younger side, you don't have any kids, you haven't gone through all of the weight fluctuations that come with having kids and you know you want to have kids, please do not go with the extra large BBL at your first round because I can promise you when you're pregnant or when you're going through all of that, you are not going to like it. Because it gets big. I've seen pregnant girls. I've, I've, seen, I've seen it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I've seen it. So please listen and don't go triple, triple XL unless you know you're going to, you know, stay on top of it. And there's some women who I who and of course, you know, Dr. Marshall, when they come in and you know, they're going to be good. They're going to be on it. But then there's other patients that, you know, they're not going to be on it. Do you counsel them before? Like, is that something that you can you know, even bring up during a consultation? You know, I think when people enter a doctor's office, their whole mindset changes. I'm under the impression that patients leave and they understand about 10% of what I told them. Number one, a lot of times they're nervous. You're exposing your, your entire body to a stranger who you've only met through... Pictures. Pictures and conversation. And then you're, you're excited you're for surgery, you're nervous, you have a lot of questions to ask. That's in the whole other topic, patients... Forget their questions. So always write down your questions when you go to a console. <laughs> you'll forget them and then you'll call the office later and blah, blah, blah. But I do find that patients don't always understand or comprehend what you say. So everything for me is on paper. I have tons of papers that I go over with people in consults and pre-ops because I know that once you leave, you're going to forget everything I said. And that's common. So I put this all down on paper. The importance of maintaining your weight. If you're somebody who's never been to the gym, never had a gym membership, just never worked out, never been a part of group fitness or anything, and now you're mm-hmm. you're slightly overweight, and now you, you're scrolling through Instagram and you want an hourglass figure, and you're feeling, okay, I'm going to get liposuction, and I want to get a BBL. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be, a, the surgery may go well. The first few years are going to go great, but if you, if you have no concept of maintaining your health with good diet, good exercise, physical fitness, you will relapse. And one of the hardest things as a surgeon to see is the patient who you did a year or two years ago comes back and says, I want lipo. And you know you snatched them up. You did maximum amount of lipo during that time, but then they come back 15, 20 pounds up. And it almost, as a surgeon, you almost feel defeated because you worked so hard for hours in the operating room to give them the body they wanted. And now they're right back where they started. And that's going to cost them a lot more money, a lot more time to recovery. In addition to those second surgeries are extremely hard, more scar tissue fibrosis, more blood loss. So we never want to operate on somebody more than once if we don't have to. But people who do have a good foundation of nutrition, some form of workouts, it's not all of a sudden going to be like a light switch after surgery and they're all of a sudden going to you know, adopt this healthy lifestyle. If you don't have it before, you likely won't have it afterwards. And that will affect the results long term. One hundred percent. And I coach my girls, you have to make the lifestyle changes prior to surgery so that you can have an easier recovery. If you work out and you're used to that muscle pain, you can have good diet after surgery. So you heal faster like you can if you are prepared prior to surgery with lifestyle changes, because one hundred percent right. If you've been eating Chick-fil-A for lunch for the last three years. That's probably not going to change after surgery and it, it's not going to do, it's not going to do you, your results justice. I'll, I'll just say that it's, as doctors, we're not trying to be mean, but we want you to get the best result because we know that you're investing a significant sum of your money, your time, your energy into our practice. And what we don't want is you to be dissatisfied with your result at the end of the day. 
they say 10% of patients take up 90% of your time. And it's usually the patients who are not happy. And over time, you know, a lot of doctors have figured out which patients are going to be the ones who are unhappy. And if you have a higher BMI and you're, if your BMI is 34 and you're trying to look like somebody whose BMI is 22, that's just not going to happen, especially with one round of surgery, in my opinion. So the better you look coming in, the better you will look going out 100%. I tell people, you do everything in your power to do what you can and we'll take it from there. But people who don't put any effort or people who have their pre-op and then come back to their surgery up five to six pounds because they say, oh, I'm getting liposuction. I'm going to eat wherever I want. It's a guarantee those people are set up for failure. And we don't want anybody to fail. We want everyone to succeed. The better you look, the better it makes us look. And everyone's happy. When everyone's happy, we all sleep better at night. And we all sleep better. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I 100% agree. And thank you so much for just giving such good information to my girls so they can be better patients, they can have better results, and they can be happy with their results, which ultimately is every surgeon out here. Ultimately, they want their patients to be happy with their results. On that note, Dr. Marshall, what are some tips that you can give my girls for making sure that they are finding the right surgeon for the procedure that they're looking for, especially BBLs? Because like you touched a second ago, Mm -hmm. You really don't want to go under three rounds of surgery, two rounds, which I feel has just come so common. Like, oh, this is my round two. This is my round three. And I know hopefully sometimes it's different procedures that you're doing. But I have seen a lot of liposuction to the same area three or four times where I'm, you don't really want that. So how do you find the right surgeon for you? Okay. So you don't have to have multiple rounds and you can get huh? good BBL results with one round. Yeah, absolutely. So I think most people these days have some sort of social media and that's how a lot of us doctors are found. And if you go to somebody's page and every patient is a, let's just say you're a, you're on the larger side and every patient on that page is a low weight, low BMI patient, I would be very wary of that doctor being able to deliver the result that you want. So if you don't see people on that social media that look like you, that's probably a good sign that that doctor is either not confident or comfortable or even wants to operate on people that look like you. Even ethnic diversity is important. It's every single person on that doctor's page is of only one ethnicity and you're a different ethnicity, then they may not know, number one, the aesthetics of your body type, whether you may be African-American, Caucasian, Hispanic, et cetera. And they may not know that your skin is going to react different. So make sure that the doctor you choose has patients that look like you. Number two, I think one of the most powerful things is just talking to other patients who have been under the care of that doctor. You say, well, how do I do that? I think there's options. There's realself.com. I think there are, you look in the comments, a lot of times the patient's like, oh my gosh, doctor, thank you. You've changed my life. I appreciate it. Just message them. A lot of patients are happy to talk about their experience. So talking to other patients to make sure that, okay, what were your expectations? Did you feel like the doctor cared for you throughout the whole process? Was it easy to get in touch with their office? If you're having trouble just getting a call back from the office or an email, that could be a sign that you may have issues post-op as well. So don't just fall in love with um, the doctor's results. Make sure that the entire office team is, has your best interest. And if you have a concern that they're going to address it, but make sure that doctor can work on your body type. That's one of the biggest misconceptions I see is that you choose somebody based upon the results on Instagram, but that doctor has never worked on someone like. And then number three, obviously, you know, make sure there's plenty of before and afters, you know. A lot of doctors get a couple of good results, post those, and then they become famous for those three or four good results. And they're not consistently doing it over and over and over and over. That would be a red flag also. Not me. I love it. Those were some gems right there. I love it because you are 100% right. I want to use this as an educational moment. Okay, Dr. Marshall. So the question everybody wants to know, why? Can we not sit on our booties after a fat transfer and for how long? Yeah, so it's always a controversial question, but I'll just tell you what I do with my patients. So once the fat is removed from your stomach, your back, your arms, your legs, wherever, that fat technically no longer has any blood supply. So when we put the fat 
in the subcutaneous space or right underneath the skin, it takes several weeks and months for new blood vessels to grow into that fat. If we allow you to sit too soon, then you are basically choking off any new blood supply that's trying to grow into that fat to keep it alive. So my general rule is eight weeks, no sitting post-op. In other countries where fat is injected into the muscle, there's less chance of this fat being injured by sitting because the fat is now surrounded by muscle with a robust blood supply that protects it better than fat that's injected just below the skin or subcutaneously. And that is why some other doctors in other countries may allow you to sit sooner, especially when the fat's injected into the muscle. My general rule is eight weeks. I think more commonly you'll see six weeks, but I do find that people, the longer they go, the better they look. So I've had girls go upwards of five months and they just look incredible. So I would say go as long as you possibly can. Don't risk it. Spend a lot of money on your procedure. Maximize your post-op care as much as possible. You heard it here. (laughs) The last thing I want to talk about, trends in plastic surgery. I think it's... Mm -hmm. I think it's an important thing for us to talk about. What do you think about the current trends in plastic surgery and where what surgeries are they're having now are being done now um, compared to years ago or what you think is even going to be happening in the future? Yeah. So some of the trends I've noticed are smaller breast implants when you do get implants. I think 10 years ago, everyone was getting really oversized, large implants, and it just didn't look proportional to anyone's body. And as you know, as you gain weight over time, which the majority of people do, those breasts will continue to grow. And women will get their implants taken out, they'll get lifts, they'll get smaller implants. And so I see a lot more surgeons leaning towards smaller implants initially. So that's the trend that I'm seeing, especially in Southern California. Liposuction is more popular than ever. It's become more accepted. I can tell you that there are very famous TV shows on major networks that have weight loss participants and trainers. Those trainers themselves get liposuction. There are, (laughs) I I, think all I'm going to tell you is that at least once a month, I do somebody who's a fitness guru on Instagram and they get liposuction. So if the fitness trainers are getting liposuction, trust me, it's available to everybody. Everybody's and, doing it. And so everyone's like, oh, well, I have fat. Well, let me just put the fat in my breasts, which is another trend. Fat transfer to the breast because people, you know, they hear about problems with implants, so they don't want multiple surgeries. And so fat transfer to the breast is becoming a lot more common. And the BBL trend, I just don't see it slowing down anytime soon because everyone wants to look good. Everybody wants to look good in a dress and in a pair of jeans. And it doesn't have to be crazy big. I think that's the big thing that people are afraid of when they come in and say, I don't want to look like XYZ celebrity. I don't want to look crazy. And I tell them, with one round, you likely won't, especially on top of the muscle. Nobody ever comes back to me and says it's too big. The first week, they may say, oh my gosh, it's huge. And then they come back in a month and say, oh my God, please tell me I'm not going to lose anymore. I love it. I hope it's (laughs) every single time, every time. And that's with me maximally filling up the buttocks. I put as much fat typically as it'll hold, but So I think the trend is can liposuction will only continue to go on the rise, especially post-COVID. We all gained a few extra pounds and liposuction just kind of took off. So small, smaller implants, more fat transfer to the breast and liposuction. That's the continued trend. Yeah, I I 100 percent agree. I do think we're going to see more natural BBLs coming Mm -hmm. out, smaller breasts. I do think smaller breast size has been kind of trending for a while. About the fat to the breast, I love that you touched on that because I've had this thought in my head and I actually talked about it with another doctor, Dr. Daniel Andre, a few weeks ago, but over a phone conversation. And we were talking about how before fat grafting to the breast was a big Uh no-no. And like, I remember when I started my career and I worked with plastic surgeons and it was always a big no-no. We're not fat grafting to the breast. We don't do that because breast cancer concerns. Uh So... I don't know what's changed or what is that risk less than what's the BII risk or what? I don't know. What do you think? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah. So I guess the thought before was that whenever you transfer fat, you're also transferring stem cells. Stem cells can essentially differentiate or become almost anything in the body. When you talk about stem cell research, taking your own fat cells and then in a lab, making a new heart or new kidney, et cetera, that, that can happen from a stem cell. Well, stem cells are very powerful. 
And so if there was ever any residual cancer in the breast, there's always concern that putting fat in the breast would cause the cancer to either come back or to develop a lot sooner. There's been lots of research that has shown that that is not the case. So from a cancer standpoint, fat transfer to the breast is safe. Oh, thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. From a cosmetic standpoint, there are only a few people who are good candidates for fat transfer to the breast. If you have any breast ptosis or sagging of the breast, you're not a good candidate. If you are a A cup with very, very tight breast skin, you're not a good candidate. The biggest complaint after a fat transfer to the breast is dissatisfaction with size. You're lucky if you get a half a cup more in growth. If you get a full cup size, that's even better. The ideal woman has B cup or C cup breast and only wants to be a full B or a full C. If that's your expectation, then you're likely going to be happy. If you're expecting to go from a B to a D, that It's possible, but you're likely going to be disappointed when it's all said and done. I find that more fat drives better in the butt than it does in the breast itself. Why that is, I I can't tell you. I think it has to do with blood supply, but more fat is lost after a breast fat transfer than with a BBL. So just know that, you know, you're taking that risk. I personally do not like putting fat in the breast anymore. The main reason why is because it is very... I wouldn't say it's common, but it would not be uncommon to get small lumps and nodules, also known as fat necrosis, in the breast after transferring the fat. When the fat dies, most of your body's white blood cells will come and break down that fat, carry it away, you dispose of it. But if it gets walled off, it can become a little hard nodule. As a woman, you don't want to fill a hard nodule in your breast because now there's always that uncertainty. Is that from the fat transfer or could that be something bad? Well, me personally, I say if you want your breast augmented, I feel very safe and comfortable putting implants in because that's the same thing I would do for my family. And that's just going to be my personal preference. And that is why it's so important for each patient to mesh with their surgeon, with what their preference is. And mm-hmm. I agree with you on the preference. I think absolutely you're not going to get a lot larger breast size just with fat. It's not replacing an implant. It's it's another option if you want, you know, at least to do something to your breast, but not do an implant. And if, and y'all have heard me say it before with my implants, if they ever give me an issue, I know it's only a real quick surgery to take them out and that's it. I'm, they're over. I'm done with them. So I know that in the back of my mind and fat grafting, I knew I couldn't get that upper pole fullness that I wanted that I really like wanted (laughs) with just fat grafting. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Marshall, I think we're getting close to the end of our episode. Is there anything that you can think of that our listeners, our girls would benefit from that we haven't already talked about? There's, there's so much. I wish we had about six hours to talk. Oh, my but. God. Hey, do not be concerned because you will be back. <laughs> <laughs> Next you time, know. we'll have you back and we can talk about something completely different. And we'll have a whole hour to talk about it because it's with plastic surgery. I think there's just so many things we can talk about. Yeah, I'll say this. I think the most important thing for a patient is to have a realistic expectation of what is possible. I see people who have a weight loss surgery, and even if you have a gastric sleeve or gastric bypass, technically, you probably shouldn't be having plastic surgery for at least a year. The general rule is once your weight has stabilized and plateaued, you should maintain that weight for at least six months prior to having any type of elective skin removal, plastic surgery, et cetera. There's a lot of things going on with your body, nutrient deficiencies, et cetera, so let your body stabilize. I see a lot of girls who... You know, I'll do a consult. I recommend they lose 15, 20 pounds, but they know that the summer's coming up. They want to look as good as they can for summer. And they, despite those recommendations, they say, no, I just want to, I want to book. And to me, you have the rest of your life to enjoy your body. The concept that I can, oh, if I don't like it, I'll just go get a revision or I'll get around to. You get one chance to do it right. If it's a tummy tuck, you get one chance to do it right. As a surgeon who does revisions, it's always a mess going back in where somebody else has been for the most part. It's easier, it's it's more cost effective for you to get it done right the first time. So if your surgeon recommends you lose 15 pounds, just do it. 
Because if you rush surgery, I guarantee you, you will not be happy with the result. Even with liposuction, we're lucky if we can take off eight to 10 pounds. So imagine if you're able to lose 10, 15 pounds of your own, you're going to lose that visceral fat, the one that makes your stomach stand out. You know, people say, oh, I'm big bone. You're not big bone. You just store fat deep inside your muscles. Your muscles are more like a ribeye steak instead of a fillet. We want you to look and feel your best. And if we give a recommendation, take the time and be patient before you pursue surgery. There is no rush. There's there's no rush that there will be another summer. There will be another opportunity to, you know, go on Bumble or Tinder or, or do whatever it is you want. Trust me, your 20-year reunion, no one cares. <laughs> Every, <laughs> so, so don't try and rush the process. And have a real estate expectation. You know, you might need two surgeries. You know, people message me and say, can I do a breast lift with implants and a tummy tuck with LiPo 360 and DBL all at once? You know, there are some surgeons who do it, but look at those results. If you have two kids and you have one piece of bread, they're both hungry. Well, you have to split that piece of bread in half and give them half a slice of bread. When you do multiple surgeries on your body, your body has only so much blood and energy to recover. So the more areas you do at one time, Each area is just giving a small bit of energy to heal and recover. So keep that in mind. Your body has only so much capacity to heal. And you don't want to compromise your breast results because you're so anxious to have your booty and your tummy done at the same time. So it's not a bad idea to sometimes split up the procedures. Yes, we know it's two surgeries and it costs more money, but you will oftentimes get a better result down the line. So keep all those things in mind. Be realistic. Your body wasn't created... You know, 30 years on this earth, you didn't get here overnight with your body looking like this. So to expect to have it looking perfect in one surgery is not always the case. That is patient. Great advice. And be patient. And let me also add, do your part. Your surgeon is only doing his part, what he can while he's in the OR, while you're under anesthesia and he's doing the surgery. Whatever you do before that and whatever you do after that is you doing your part to help maximize the results that he worked so hard or she worked so hard to get in the operating room for you. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our patients just need to, you know, know that, hey, I need to do my part or else I'm not going to look like this picture that I'm bringing in or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get the results that I was looking for if I don't do my part. Uh, So I want you guys to be responsible patients, listen to your doctor and make the lifestyle changes prior to surgery to help you have a better recovery and better results. I don't think there's, I really, what else can we say, Dr. Marshall? What else can we add to that? Uh, There's, there's so much to add, but you know, you know, be safe. You know, you have a family, you have people care about you. So Make sure you're, you know, you choose a surgeon and a facility and a city and location that is safe and guarantees you're going to come home to your family. Plastic surgery isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. The economy will go up and down. Your finances will go up and down. But plastic surgeons aren't going anywhere. Why they accept it? People are getting plastic surgery left and right. But it's not a one-stop shop. It doesn't fix, you know, 30 years of, you know, bad eating and bad lifestyle choices. But I would say, do your research. Don't rush into it. If you haven't done more than one, two, three consults, then I would say that's an issue because just because one plastic, we all say different things. If you show one person's body to 99 plastic surgeons, we're all going to have a different opinion. So do your research, do your consults. I think having uh, plastic surgery consultants like this podcast, having someone guide you who's been through the process is extremely important because let's just be honest, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so don't be afraid to seek help. Ah, you used my line. You don't know what you don't know. And it's so true, guys. You don't know what you don't know. And oh. I think Annalisa has said it before on a past episode that we, we're we just here to help. We just want to help you guys have a great recovery, a great experience. It doesn't have to be you know, what you see online. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be pleasant if you plan well and you do your research, it can be great. So Dr. Marshall, where can my girls find you? I try to keep a low profile. I'm very busy, (laughs) uh, you know, but uh, if they really, really want to find me, they can find my Instagram at at Dr. Andre Marshall, D-R-A-N-D-R-E-M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. 
or my website, www.drandremarshall.com. We do provide complimentary virtual consultations that are done through our website. So if you want to go on, submit your photos and your history, I will review those and provide that at no charge. In-person consultation, if you have a fee, you can contact my office and we'll get you set up with that. But I do lots of consultations from all over the world thanks to our virtual consultation template. That's awesome. You guys, if you are considering a BBL and you have not checked him out, Dr. Andre Marshall on Instagram, go right now and schedule your consultation because you guys, he is delivering. The other day you posted a before and after picture and I, I shared it because I was like, God, he said reverse. He said reverse, reverse. She completely oh. different woman, completely different woman. <laughs> And I even had patients or DMs like, was that only one round? So my question is, was that only one round? It was. was, Yeah. yeah, The Mm -hmm. one. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, Yeah. One round. Wow. You're amazing. No. You know what? It's the patients. Some of these patients will go five, six months without sitting. They'll do everything I literally tell them to do. And they're patient. They said, you're right. Keep getting better with time. And. You know, I can only take credit for so much. You know, I do a lot of BBLs. You know, on average, I'll probably do about eight BBLs a week. I do the whole case. I don't have any ghost surgeons running around. Like, well, I'm yeah. not going to mention. You should, but, but, I, but say it, say I, it. I do everything myself. Be careful. <laughs> my six to eight surgeries a day. The main surgeon may inject your fat, but other surgeons are doing your liposuction. So when you see these high volume clinics for BBLs for five to $6,000 in other countries and in maybe even South, Southern Florida, you know exactly what's happening. So don't say you haven't been warned. But anyway, I do the entire surgery. I do no more than two cases a day. And I do the case from from start to finish. I uh, I love it. And (laughs) let me let me tell you, I actually you guys know I talk to a lot of women and I talked to somebody a few days ago and she told me that she found out that a clinic, I don't remember the name of the clinic. Honestly, these clinics in Florida, I really don't even keep up with them, but they were doing 200 cases a week. (laughs) <laughs> like, does that not sound like outrageous? <laughs> that doesn't even sound right. That doesn't no even sound to... right. Like how? And it's, well, I think it was a bunch of surgeons together in one mm-hmm. big group. But the patients are told that the surgeon does between five to eight surgeries a day, which <laughs> I mean, it uh-huh. goes exactly to what you're saying, which is there's no way. <laughs> Physically, I mean, I'm a pretty stout guy. I'm a football player, uh, you know, I try to stay in shape. And even two BBLs, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much beat at the end of the day because I give it my all. You know, I'm not cutting corners. I'm doing max lipo. You know, I'm doing true lipo 360. I'm not leaving the upper back untouched. I even, my lipo 360 includes the armpit, the bra roll fat that a lot of surgeons don't do for whatever reason, whether it's for time, money, et cetera. I include all of that. So and after two surgeries, on average, about two and a half to three hours each, I'm done. Yeah, you're. So. It's that lipo arm. <laughs> it is. It is. So. so, do your research, girls. And if you're thinking about a BBL, you already know who to look for, Dr. Andre Marshall, out of Beverly Hills, California. Thank you so much for being on the show with me. I can't wait to have you back. You know, you're. This is going to be a repeat over and over because there's so many things we can talk about, and I've had such a good time talking to you. I can't wait for us to do this again. I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. All right, you guys. I'll see y'all next week. Before I let you go, if you want to support the show, if this show has in any way helped you along your journey and you want to show me a little love, you guys can purchase Bruise Juice. So through the website, bigbuttsnolies.com, you go to shop and you see Bruise Juice lips and Bruise Juice body. I also offer consultations over the phone. If you just need some guidance, you're like really confused. You don't know what the next steps are. You know, you want to have surgery, but it's just so overwhelming to you. Go to my website, book a consultation with me. I swear to God, by the end of our phone call, you're going to have an idea of who you're going to, where you're going, what look you're going to have, how much you're going to spend. We'll have it down. Secondly, you can join the membership. That's another way to support the show. That helps me have a more one-on-one guide. You can have me as your guide. So I help you along the way. You can text me questions. If anything comes up that you're like unsure about, you have an expert on speed dial. And the third way, you can send me a donation. I accept all of your donations with lots of love. 
you can send it to me through Cash App Mavi 20. And that's it, you guys. I'll see y'all next week. I would like to end this episode with a huge thank you to all of our listeners. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe to Big Butts No Lies Podcast and follow us on Instagram at Big Butts No Lies Podcast. If you have a topic you want me to cover, please send it to the DM. If you know anyone on their plastic surgery journey, be sure to recommend them the show. You can also visit us on our website, bigbuttsnolies.com. You'll see the online surgical recovery store. We're adding new items all the time. If there's something you think I need to have on there, send me a DM. (laughs) Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget, new episodes every Monday. I'll see you then.